Well, hello everyone and welcome to another story time. If this is your first time here with me during a story time, then let me explain what's going on. I love doing makeup. My YouTube channel is primarily focused on beauty and fashion, started as just a beauty channel and then morphed like so many of us do. And I still love doing my makeup and sharing things like that with you, but I occasionally just like to chit chat and just looking at you and talking is boring for everyone involved, so I'm combining the two. I am playing with some new to me makeup, so if you're interested in all the products I'm using, please be sure to check the description box. I'll list the products in the order in which I'm applying them with shades and links and all those things. If you're here just for the story, then you don't need to worry about that. I had a different topic in mind. It was going to be about me being on YouTube for 10 plus years and what would I change or do differently or what advice would I give to myself if I could start all over. And I'm still gonna do that and I'm gonna do that next month. And if you have specific questions on that, leave those down in the comments and I will make a note of them and make sure I get to those next month. But this month, two things happened. One, it's Halloween or the month of Halloween. And so all things spooky are on our minds. Also, we just recently booked another cruise for my husband and myself. And every time we talk about cruising, this particular story comes up. I need to do a few disclaimers. I don't know if I need to, but I want to. And one of them is, if it's not obvious from the title or the thumbnail, this story does involve extreme violence, murder in fact. There is nothing entertaining or funny about any of this. The reason I am sharing this particular story is twofold. One, to this day, five years later, this still comes up in conversation when people say, oh, have you ever done an Alaskan cruise? And I say yes, and then they go, oh, was that the cruise where the guy murdered his wife? Five years later, and also, because it is thankfully a rare thing to have personally or even slightly tangentially experienced a crime. Now I'm not a victim of this crime. I didn't actually observe this crime. I was not a witness, but it's an odd feeling to know that a murder happened so close to you. And so I thought this would make for, I don't wanna say interesting, but it's a story time of note. So let's, Go back in time to July 2017. My husband, Michael, and I decided to celebrate our tw then 20th wedding anniversary with a family trip. So we booked an Alaskan cruise on uh, the Emerald Princess through Princess Cruise Lines for us and our two sons who were teenagers at the time. This was definitely a bucket list type of cruise. And yes, I would recommend the cruise, not to younger families, most of the activities and excursions that you can do are much more active. So it's really not a great cruise for young families. We splurged a little bit because it was our 20th. It was a special trip. So we got, I think it was like a junior suite cabin. This is relevant to the story with a really um, big balcony and great views because one of the high points of the Alaskan cruise is you sail by the glaciers through the fjords and they kind of stop the ship and everybody gets to see it and it's, it's supposed to be amazing. I say supposed to be because we didn't get to do that part. Under the circumstances is more than understandable and I, I feel like I need to be very clear, I am not complaining about that, but it's part of the story. I can't even remember at what point in the cruise this was. We had had some amazing excursions, just unbelievable, once in a lifetime things, really cool experience. And at this point, we it was a at sea day. And that evening, the four of us had gone to dinner like usual. And at some point in the dinner, my youngest son and I, Shane and I, just weren't feeling great. We both had headaches. I don't know if we were just both dehydrated or what, but we decided to go back to the room while my husband, Michael, and our oldest son, Jake, hung out in the dining room, kind of leisurely finished their dinner. So Shane and I are chilling in our room, we're watching some kind of movie, and it was about nine-ish at night, and the alarms start going off, and the, the intercom system clicks on, and someone's, you can hear the fear in their voice, and they're yelling, emergency, emergency, security needed, on deck nine, and Shane and I just stop and look at each other, because we're on deck nine. Port side, we're like, wait, we're on the port side. Stern, back of the ship. We were almost to the front of the ship. So we're like, 
okay. And we're just kind of sitting there going, what do we do? I guess we should just stay in our room. We didn't hear any commotions or anything like that. These cruise ships, even the Emerald Princess, which is considered on the smaller side, they're huge. So if we're at the front of the boat and whatever's going on is at the back of the boat, we're not gonna hear it. We're gonna have no idea that that's going on. And then about 15 minutes or so later, the intercom gets back on again and it was basically like, everything's fine. There was a domestic disturbance. Everything's under control. Go back to what you were doing. Nothing to see here, don't look. I mean, obviously they didn't say that part. That was implied. Now we have heard since when talking to other passengers that there was some sort of murder mystery play going on somewhere else on the ship. And so when that notice came on, a lot of the passengers thought it was just part of the murder mystery and nobody really gave it a lot of thought. The evening continues, we don't give it a second thought, everybody goes to sleep and we set our alarm extra early because that morning, the next morning, we were supposed to wake up to views of the glaciers in the fjords, very exciting, you know, big part of the trip. Okay, next morning comes six o'clock in the morning, we open the curtains and we are not seeing glaciers. We are not in a fjord, we are seeing what looks like we're pulling into a port. And within a few minutes, the captain gets on the intercom and I cannot remember verbatim. I did a whole Alaskan cruise vlog. I'm sure I touched on this then and I will link that above and down below if you're interested in that. Just if you're interested in going on an Alaskan cruise, what do you wear, what do you pack? I have a few of those videos, I'll list those below. Anyway, so the captain gets on and he essentially says something to the effect of, as you can tell, we are not outside the fjords. Um, unfortunately, there was an incident on the ship and a passenger died. Um, and he went into detail. He, he said it was deck nine. Like, I believe he may have even said what cabin it was and her age and where she was from, which I thought was really odd that he was sharing those kind of details. And he said, um, so obviously we have to skip the glaciers and we're gonna pull right into Juneau where the FBI is waiting to board the ship. Obviously, whatever happened last night was a little worse than they were letting on. So we're just kind of sitting there like, what do, you, what do we do? And I'm pretty sure he basically said, stay in your cabins because the FBI is gonna to want to investigate or interview people. I can't remember specifically. You'd think this stuff would be seared into my brain, but you're sitting there going, okay, this is crazy. Also, I know my kids are teenagers. They're not little kids, but they're still my kids. So I'm thinking, I don't want them to like be exposed to, to see anything terrible, to, you know. So we're just trying to remain calm so that they don't buy in, you know, start to get nervous or like what's happening. And then my husband goes, well, I wanna go see. Just a little background if you don't know. So Michael is an attorney and he started his career as an active duty military attorney, also known as a JAG. Part of that was he was attached to the US Attorney's Office. He was a special US attorney. And he was actually a criminal prosecutor. Wow, this is a lot of bronzer. We're just gonna keep going here. And so he was a criminal prosecutor with the US Attorney's Office and the Air Force. And so I don't know if it was just his professional curiosity and the fact that it was just down the hall. So he's like, I'm just gonna go see if they've actually secured the scene. Like, what are you gonna do? Anyway, so he did walk down there and they did have a security guard from the ship sitting on a folding chair just outside the room where the, what do you call it, the incident happened. And Michael said he did see, the door was closed, but there was, it was obvious from handprints and smudges on the door that something very, very bad had happened in that room. So he came back to our room and then we just basically spent the next, I can't remember, seven hours or so just hanging out on the ship. They did eventually tell us it was okay to walk around the ship unless you were you know, directly in those set of rooms near where the murder happened and I think above and below because they wanted to interview all of those people as potential witnesses. Obviously, everyone's excursions got canceled and, and that was the weird part is that people were complaining that they missed their excursions. I can't remember what we, I know we had something scheduled, but I can't at this time even remember what we were supposed to be doing in Juneau. We obviously didn't do it, and it obviously wasn't that big of a deal because I can't even remember what it was, nor should it be a big deal considering the reason for why we missed it. But people were like, asked, they were, not just that they were complaining about the inconvenience or the disappointment of missing it, but also that they felt like the cruise ship should reimburse them or not just reimburse them because I think that everyone who paid for those excursions obviously were refunded if you missed it, but given some sort of compensation for our inconvenience. I'm like, somebody 
died horribly. Like this is, that was weird. But I will admit, I also kind of understand people's reactions being completely inappropriate because I think that's actually a normal reaction to something horrible happening is people respond very inappropriately because you, you just don't know how to respond. Weirdly, the ship did reimburse everyone like $200 for their inconvenience, which I thought was totally unnecessary, but whatever. And then we started, you know, piecing together what happened. And for a while, it was obviously all just hearsay and gossip. There were some people on the ship that knew the family. So what had happened was, and here we get to the story part, it was a large family group. So it was a husband and wife, their three daughters, who I believe at the time were like high school age, middle school, and maybe elementary age. And then her side of the family, her parents, her brothers, possibly their wives, extended family, so forth. So it was about a group of 11 to 12 people. And apparently that night, they got into an argument, the husband and wife. They, the husband had been drinking heavily throughout the day and into the evening. If you're interested in reading his transcript, I found an article that has his FBI interview. It's, if you like what, like true crime stuff, it's fascinating because it's it's not embellished, it's not actors, it's literally just word for word what's being said. It's, it's very interesting. So according to all the interviews and the um, husband's own testimony, they got in a huge fight. The kids were there. They, he, the husband told the kids to go to the adjoining cabin so they could still hear everything as they were screaming at each other, but they didn't see the incident. Apparently the wife asked for a divorce. He was not happy about that. And he proceeded to beat her to death. His excuse at one point was she wouldn't stop laughing at me. That's a headline that hit a lot of the blogs and news websites. Unfortunately, Horribly, the children heard her screaming, ran and got their uncles, and the uncle or an uncle or several of her brothers managed to get through the door as he was, the husband, was trying to drag her body out of the room and attempt to throw her overboard. They stopped that. Obviously, security came. Now, fast forward next day, obviously, the FBI boarded the ship, took him into custody, got the family off the ship, interviewed all the potential witnesses. And at some point within, I'd say mid afternoon, I believe everyone who wasn't a witness was cleared to get off the ship. And then we just weirdly just went on with the cruise. Like obviously people kept talking about it, but it was a very weird, it was very weird because for us, we didn't know these people. We didn't know the extent of how bad it was. Most of what we learned was once we got off the ship and things were printed in, you know, on websites. It's very, very weird. But anyway, what ended up happening was it took a very long time for the wheels of justice to turn. The murder happened in July, 2017. Obviously he was immediately arrested. He ended up pleading guilty to second degree murder in February, 2020, almost three years later. And then he wasn't sentenced until I believe June, 2021. And then weirdly, he was found dead in his prison cell, July, 2021. He had originally been sentenced to 30 years in federal prison with no chance of parole. And then once released, he would be uh, sentenced to five years of supervised release. He served technically one month of his sentence. And I tried to find something and maybe I just wasn't looking very hard, but no cause of death was released. They said he was found unresponsive and then ultimately pronounced dead. Was not COVID related. That's all they said. And that is the sad, sad, sad story of our Alaskan cruise. Now I did ask my husband, why did it take so long? to get everything sentenced and, and all that. And he did say that from what he saw, the defense team was trying to possibly establish an insanity plea uh, in the documents that I had read. He apparently had an IQ of 80. He had a bipolar diagnosis. He was on a lot of conflicting medications. There was a lot of alcohol involved. So they were trying possibly for an insanity defense. And then the delay from pleading guilty to the actual sentencing was probably a couple of things. One, obviously COVID had a part in the delaying the proceedings, but
but then also he said they were probably doing what's called a social study to see if there were possible mitigating factors for sentencing. And he said, based on the 30-year sentence, that it appears that there were some mitigating factors that the judge took into account. With federal sentencing, there's very little wiggle room that a judge can give on sentencing. Federal crimes have very specific rules, let's just say, as far as sentencing goes. Apparently, there were a few that applied here. I know that the true crime genre has a huge following. So many people are interested myself included, but I will admit it is a very different feeling to be even remotely, I don't want to say connected to, but to be aware that it's happening. It's not quite as fascinating, I'd say, when it's like real. It's real and it's happening. It is a tragedy. There's no way around this. You know, um, a family has been forever destroyed. Three children will never have their mother or their father again. Obviously, the parents and the extended family and friends are forever affected by this. It is truly a horrible situation. Like I said, this got a lot of coverage. I think it even made the cover of People magazine. Apparently, I did learn that there are often deaths on a cruise ship. Usually it is not a homicide, uh, in particular on an Alaskan cruise where the demographic skews much older than usual. They tend to have at least one or two deaths per cruise. And here's a morbid fun fact. Apparently there is a morgue on most, if not all cruise ships, and they can accommodate a certain number, limited number of bodies. And then as far as just criminal law goes, because apparently this occurred not in international waters, but not in a specific state's waters. I don't think states have, I don't, whatever. I don't really know how that worked. That it turned into federal law and not like Alaskan law in this case, which would have made a difference in the sentencing. That's kind of interesting. That is the very, very sad, tragic, and admittedly weird story of our experience on an Alaskan cruise where murder occurred. If you'd like to find out more information, I will list a couple of the resources that I looked at to refresh my memory of all the events that happened. Thank you for hanging out with me today. Remember, if you're interested in any of the stuff that actually went on here, do please check the description box and I will see you in the next video. Bye.